Hello, Philip. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to, see, to all see all the people joining, the people joining here to today's to topic. Today's topic. And thanks for the, the, for the introduction, Juan B. Um, uh, well, I have, well, I have the, mission the mission to introduce to, 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 to today's, today's topic. topic. So I will, so I will provide, provide you with a presentation, presentation on our technology. Um, so let me share my screen. Share the screen, all right. So can you... Yes, we can see. All your... right, all right. Great. Well, uh, let's jump into the presentation. Um, well, Biomakers is a smart active company founded in 2015 um, by two entrepreneurs who have long, who has long experience um, in the next generation um, sequencing uh, technologies. Um, in order to diagnose, diagnose soil health and, 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 and also human health uh, diseases. So basically, in a nutshell, um, we combine next generation DNA sequencing technologies plus um, a ecological computing to unveil a new dimension of um, soil analysis using the soil microbiome as the most powerful indicator, um, understanding that soil uh, is a living ecosystem and therefore um, can have health. Um, today, soil health um, is a hot topic um, across the globe. Many, many uh, governments and also like stakeholders are concerned uh, because of the um, degradation of soil and thus the um, loss of biodiversity and functionality of soils. And why is soil um, so crucial for human beings? Well, uh, soil, thanks to the soil, we can um, soil provide us like 90% of the food that comes from soil. Um, soil uh, hosts more than 25% of the biodiversity in the planet. And last but not least, soil is crucial for the biogeochemical um, cycling of water and, and nitrogen and carbon. Uh, well, carbon, as you might know, is also a trending topic uh, today because soil has been acknowledged as a potential um, solution to climate change as soils obviously has a massive potential to draw down uh, carbon. And well, driven by our mission to restore soil health worldwide, we have developed this cutting edge technology that I will explain you in the coming slides. So this is um, a bit on our workflow. So this slide's name is from a soil sample to a functional indexes. Um, so basically what we do is receiving samples in our lab. Then first we start extracting the DNA containing in all those uh, soil samples. Then um, from this specific DNA change, we use some proprietary primers, um, well, proprietary primers, but uh, like in, in 16S and ITS, uh, 16S to identify bacterial archaea and ITS for the fungi. Um, and so we start portioning this DNA chain into specific regions to further start sequencing. So basically through a um, Illumina sequencer, we can start reading all the nucleotides and code in these specific regions. So this is what we call the uh, wet lab phase. And then we start the uh, dry, fa dry phase of the process where all these uh, nucleotides, this raw data uh, is um, processed through a bioinformatic pipeline. Uh, and obviously here is where uh, all the intelligent computing comes into the stage and, and, and we can therefore start 
doing our functional prediction. All the information, all the indexes that we compute, then uh, we share them into a, into a cloud system. And then we transfer all those results into the uh, Bicro portal that we have. It's a digital platform where all customers from biomakers can have access to it. Uh, we use the soil microbiome as a powerful biomarker. And, and we basically, um, the different markers that we use to do this uh, functional prediction are mainly three. So the taxonomic biomarkers, so knowing that a, um, a specific sequence encode for, uh, encode for a specific um, species, we can therefore um, compute the relative abundance of specific um, uh, species or or, uh, or genus uh, in the in in a soil sample, and this is relevant because we um, one of our indexes is related to the disease risk associated to specific pathogens. So knowing that a specific um, pathogen. Uh, is uh, in a high relative abundance, we can infer therefore that it is representing or is uh, presenting a, a, a high um, disease risk. So then we go beyond this taxonomic biomarker and we go um, into the gene, uh, into a gene level. So for example, here we have um, the nutrient met metabolic pathways. Uh, and for example, knowing that specific enzymes are decoded by a specific DNA uh, sequence, uh, therefore we can basically uh, infer whether the soil microbiome is immobilizing some nutrients in the soil or making them available. In the case of uh, hormones and stress sensing compounds and biocontrol activity, we have Courier database. Um, so basically, we have um, scientific repositories uh, so that we can link basically uh, a specific, the presence of a specific uh, um, species in the soil with a specific function. And last but not least, we have a unique approach uh, to assess the ecological networks of the soil microbial communities. So um, we study the co-occurrence and co-exclusion patterns in order to assess the resilience of the soil system. What are the unique selling points of biomakers technology? Well, first of all, we have a rockstar team um, with more than 30% of our um, colleagues with uh, PhD degrees. We have uh, well, from bioinformatics, data scientists, um, bio, biochemical like professionals working hard to develop and, and further develop this cutting edge technology. Um, we have more than nine patents on our technology. Um, so this is on the side of our proprietary tech. Then as we as we have developed a unique standard to assess so soil biology, well, this, as soon as you start developing a new standard, you need to benchmark it. So we have today the largest uh, microbial reference database in the world. We have identified more than 7.7 .7 millions of microbes. And uh, we already processed more than 27,000 samples in 150 different crops across 40 countries uh, in the globe. And uh, last, the scientific validation. We believe that it's cru crucial um, to every new technology to have a scientific validation. And therefore, we've been collaborating with uh, academic partners and universities to conduct several studies, such as the one that um, my colleagues will present you in, in, in the next presentations. And, um, and we have more than 120 collaborations with, with those institutions. We always um, make 
all this information and publications available. So I encourage you to enter into our website and to click on tech validation so that you can have access to all our publications. This is Biomaker's ecosystem. Uh, on the left side, you will find like all the initiatives initiatives that we are currently leading and on the right side is the solutions that I will go um, a bit uh, on, on, on details in the next slides. Um, just to give you a, a short like overview on uh, our initiatives. Well, first the Soil Squad. Soil Squad uh, was an initiative launched this year and the aim is to build a network of professionals that empower this new transition to regenerative agriculture. Um, we are basically providing those professionals with a super innovative uh, learning platform. Um, we grant them also um, some, some discounts and uh, basically we ultimately look to build a network, a powerful network and to basically to deploy the use of, of big crop to spread the use of our big crop technology in the in the whole uh, agri-food ecosystem. Then Fields Forever, well Fields Forever um, was an initiative granted by the European Union in 2020 and basically this, the, this initiative allows us to um, grant access to several partners to our technology um, to validate our technology while obviously building uh, our database. We have committed more than 20,000 samples across the globe and, uh, and well, one of the success cases will be presented in, in, in the next presentations. Um, so we'll jump to, the, to our products. First of all, um, I will talk about Bicrop. Bicrop is becoming the standard to assess soil biology worldwide. Um, big crop assess we have more than 40 different metrics but in a nutshell uh, we assess the biodiversity of soils uh, we assess the functionality uh, meaning obviously uh, all those microorganisms present if they can perform a function or not this is uh, highly crucial and then obviously the resistance. The resistance is linked to the network properties. I mean, how resilient is the soil based on this um, game changing approach that we are applying um, when analyzing a soil sample. Then we have the health chapter where we assess um, the genetic potential of the soil microbiome to produce biocontrol agents such as biofungicides, bioinsecticides and so on. The hormone production um, all the plant growth promoting compounds such as the giverlin, such as the auxin that can obviously have a major impact on the abiotic uh, and biotic um, stress like toleration of crops. And then the stress sensing adapting compounds such as for example the exopolysaccharide production um, and so on. And then last but not least we assess the nutrient metabolic pathways of major and minor uh, compounds. So uh, in the whole nutrient metabolic pathways, you have like several enzymes, as I mentioned, we can therefore uh, assessing the, by assessing also the relative abundance, we can therefore um, compute or infer whether the soil microbiome is making forms of nutrients available or not. Our new Bicrop 2.0 includes a new cutting edge like indexes such as the fun fungi to bacteria ratio, the, a new soil quality index that it's based on the network properties and uh, an absolute quantification of bacterial fungi. Um, this is, uh, has been like a big effort and you, we included basically a DNA spike uh, technology to obtain this absolute quantification. We have, uh, all our customers have, can have access to agronomic digital tools. So once, um, once they sign up as a, as a customer, they can have a free access to our Bicro portal where you have like several agronomic tools um, 
to benchmark uh, the results and, and well, several, several other tools to enhance decision making. And, you know, we have several cases uh, with, with Bcrop. Um, basically, a lot of customers are assessing low and, and, and high yield paddocks, looking at a new dimension of information. They can tailor PRAM protection programs by knowing, obviously, um, better details about the, 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 real, the disease risk. Uh, terra characterizations in vineyards is, is, we have like several cases doing this, obviously knowing a specific microbial arrangement in the soil, this can lead to um, a specific terra characterization based on the soil microbiome and so on. This is what is Bicrop all about. It's an all-in-one genetic assessment. Um, and here I will briefly mention just a user case. In this case is um, a case in Salinas, California with the Brussels, Brussels probe where the farmer realized that something was wrong because he was applying um, high rates of NPK fertilizer, but those fertilizer were not obviously being um, uh, plant available. So he did like several big crops and we realized that actually the nutrient competition indexes were high for phosphorus, potassium and sulfur. Well, therefore he decided to reduce the use of chemical compounds of NPK fertilizer by 50% to cut this, uh, this, uh, this NPK fertilization and to add some bio-based um, inputs. So he started adding some uh, bioinoculants and therefore he can, this lead to obviously to a massive uh, uh, cost savings and, 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 and therefore he improves their profits while obviously being more sustainable. The second product that is based on Bicrop technology is called Geom. It's a scientifically validated testing protocol. Um, so basically here the aim is to test the efficacy of um, products, uh, different ag inputs, agricultural practices, or in, in, in the case of today's webinar, um, seeds or, or, or crops in the soil microbiome. So um, depending on the customer's questions that they may want to solve, we have different programs. So for example, we can test the effect trends of a specific product. So to test basically if the claim of a product is to solubilize phosphate, we can do that um, probably in one location. Uh, then to respond to the question like, why is my product performing uh, more efficiently in, 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 in a specific soil and climate condition? Uh, there, therefore we need obviously more locations. And last but not least, uh, what we call the GM Advanced that it's aimed to develop predictive models, uh, predictive, GIL predictive models. Um, and, and we, I will jump into the next slide where we, uh, where we conduct like a, a, a project uh, with Biocrop Science in the US where we develop a, ma a machine learning predictive models. We need a specific experimental setup to perform a GEOM project. This is highly crucial. Um, obviously we need uh, to capture um, the soil microbial profile before a product is applied and after a product is applied uh, to subtract the effect of, of environment uh, differences. Obviously we took samples from the control plot and the treated plot after the product is applied. This allows us to um, perform a delta delta approach. So by doing this, obviously we reduce the um, the natural variance that may occur due to due to I mean time or natural conditions. And um, it's also relevant that we run a thorough statistic statistic analysis in order to infer whether the change uh, is statistically significant or not. We use basically as I mentioned, the same technology. So in a GM report, you will find all basically the same indexes. But here we compare always like sample to sample. The main difference between um, Bicrop is that 
in BigCrop, we always compare it um, the samples within our crop specific global database. Here is um, the success case that I wanted to show you. Um, this uh, is a study uh, conducted last year that uh, basically end, ends up in a, in a publication in a top nature one uh, scientific journal. Here we basically, we um, assess the specific effect of a biofungicides in three locations. We use like four time points, two treatments, a control and a treated parcel, and we use 10 replicates per treatment. And well, the main objective of, of this study was to develop a predictive model. So um, to predict the impact on, on, on yield when applying these specific biofungicides. And basically what we, what we develop is a super accurate predictive model with a eight, more than 84% of accuracy. So basically this allow biocrop um, bio science to tailor the product recommendation, to automatize the product recommendations based on this uh, machine, machine learning like algorithm. And this obviously uh, is a game changing project because therefore buyer can ensure the return on investment when selling these specific biofungicides. The new, the new product that we are launching, we are launching um, today, um, today is, is, uh, is uh, Pickup Rate. It's a game changing um, sustainable farming rate based on the soil network properties. So this is based on our publications that we um, published uh, last year. And basically it's, um, it's a sustainability, um, uh, sustainability uh, certification um, based on the, on, the, on the network properties of the soil microbial communities. So uh, I would, I also I always like to explain this in a super natural in a super uh, easy easy to understand way. So as as soon as we start obviously shifting and 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 uh, using you know fertilizers and agrochemicals in a yeah. in a in a high, in pressure, a high pressure the the the, the soil the soil, soil microbiome then obviously, then obviously to to, to to make, to make specific, specific arrangements. arrangements. So in this so case, in if case, you see if the, you chart see the chart here, you see an ecosystem where all those um, taxons tends to form like form clusters. Like clusters. Um, um, you see sorry, that, that. Um, um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, we, it's half past five and we have right. two more right. presented. So okay. you, you have like two minutes left. No worries, uh, no worries. No worries. I'm sorry, I was, I was not checking my, <laughs> my time. Uh, so basically this new bigger rate, as I said, is uh, based on the network properties of soil um, uh, microbial communities. Uh, it's independent of crop and geographic locations. And it's obviously based as we aim to ensure a high resolution. It's based on a certain number of samples per field, per block or per farm. This is my last slide. So basically this, uh, this project that our uh, next presenters will uh, address, it's within the frame of our Fields for Every initiative. We have conducted more than 180 projects. We have granted more than 25 uh, samples. And uh, obviously with several partners that engage in this, in this uh, initiative. This, is a, this was my presentation. We are empowering a data-driven agriculture all across the value chain. And here you can find some of our um, customers uh, today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, I'm going to invite now Enrico. Gonna, I'm going to remove you. Uh, however, at the end of the session, we uh, you are gonna have a brain, you know, um, answer and question session with Enrico and Roberto. So I'm going to remove you, Philip. Thank right. you. Good afternoon, Enrico. 
I, um, I'm, make one, make I'm, one. I'm going to present your video first. Uh, Juan, Juan, if you want, if you want to, save to save some time, some time. I can I say, can two, say two, two words and we can skip the, the video and go straight to the, to the presentation. It is the best for me. Okay, it's, if you prefer okay. that, okay. you can go over the presentation. Up to you. Okay, okay, okay. okay. So hello, 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 hello everyone. everyone. My warm, My warm welcome. welcome. Um, um, first of all, let me show me something, something about, about the Unimore, Unimore University of Modena Reggio Emilia and more specifically the PhD course that is hosted by our university and that uh, hosted our research. Uh, Modena and Reggio Emilia are two cities in the north part of Italy in the middle of the Po Valley Plain in between Milan and Bologna. And our PhD course, as you can see uh, here, deals with the production, processing, quality and safety of agricultural raw materials and foods. Uh, the teaching board is composed by 21 uh, researchers and professors and uh, host even eight uh, researchers from abroad. So let's start with a presentation that is just an introduction uh, that I'm pleased to summarize some of the challenges that are faced by the maize community in our country and around the world, as well as the opportunities offered by the new technologies and knowledges of the soil microbiomes. Italy and France have historically been two major producers of corn in the old continent. Uh, from about 30 million tons of grain, produced in the year 2000, just to give an idea, they represented 50% of the European production of corn. In the recent past, uh, we have witnessed a shift toward Eastern countries of both cultivated areas and total production. Hungary, Romania, uh, along with Russia and Bulgaria are now the main producers. However, corn is a fundamental crop for Italian agriculture, is still a fundamental crop, especially in the deep fertile soils of the traditional area of the Po Valley, which represents the Italian corn belt. 94% of the total Italian production comes from the top 33 provinces. And notwithstanding the high yield per hectare, when analyzing corn production over the past 10 years, a large yield gap could be observed with some variability from region to region. The ideal condition for raising corn are now challenged in view of the changing climate. So from a brief comparison of the thermal trends of the last 60 years in our region, Emilia-Romagna region, it is possible to observe an increase of 1.4 and 0.8 degrees Celsius for maximum and minimum temperature during summer, respectively. Despite no significant variation in total rainfall was revealed, an increased probability of summer days, tropical nights, and heat waves combined with erratic rainfall distribution is expected for the future. Okay, so from a crop physiology point of view, the difficult challenge of crop productivity is the result of a three-way interaction between environmental factors, genotypic traits, and cultivation techniques. In fact, in open field condition, maize production depends on the total amount of photosynthetically active radiation that reaches the earth surface that the crop is able to intercept, efficiently convert it into dry matter and fractionate it in the harvested grains. Eventually, maize production practices and dynamics are affected by several biotic and abiotic concerns. The concept of sustainable intensification applies when agricultural yields 
are increased without adverse environmental impact and without the conversion of additional non-agricultural land. On the, on the one end, we have relatively little time to understand the molecular basis of adaptation. On the other hand, an increasing opportunity is represented by the combined management of the chemical and biological fertility of the soil, thanks to the role of the beneficial microorganisms. The prerequisites for achieving greater sustainability through the use of soil microbiota are the complexity and dynamism of agricultural systems, the potential contribution of any type of farming system, the general positive effect deriving from the management of soil microbiota in maize production. It has been demonstrated that plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, PGPR, and arboscular mycorrhizal fungi, AMF, can play important roles in mineral nutrition and in secondary metabolism modulation, leading to increased resilience and tolerance, crop yield, and also food quality. The complex plant soil microbiota relationships are not easy to understand for all crops. However, it seems that environmental condition, as well as soil microbial communities, affect all plant traits in both positive and feedback direction. To conclude, we can propose a simple 3E rule, exploring, enhancing, exploiting soil microbiota can be an effective way towards greater sustainability. And the PhD project we have undertaken in the public-private partnership between our university, Unimore, and Corteva could represent an interesting example of gaining knowledge about the maize soil microbiota interaction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Enrico. Um, please don't hesitate to uh, make your question. Uh, then at the end, we can do um, um, a round table with all of you to answer the, the attendees audience. Um, okay. Now is the turn for Roberto Gatti. So I'm going to invite him to the screen and I'm going to remove you from here. Enrico, thank you so much, Enrico. Hello, good afternoon, Roberto. Everybody, everybody. Hi. I'm going to, you can start presenting. I'm going to toggle my video for you. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, great. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody. Uh, before starting uh, to speak about the project, I would like to spend a few words to introduce myself and the company I work for. Uh, my name is Roberto Gatti. I am working for Corteva AgriScience. I am part of Corteva's European production research team uh, with the main responsibility for, this, for, for Southern Europe and the aim to improve uh, seed production uh, seed quality and seed sustainability uh, in that area. What about Corteva AgriScience? Corteva is a top player in the agriculture industry. Uh, despite being formally uh, rather a new company, officially founded in 2019, it brings with it a long tradition and heritage uh, of three uh, agricultural leaders. 
And namely, we are speaking about DuPont, who has a long history in protecting uh, plants for crops from, uh, from pests. We're speaking about Dow, who has experience in both crop protection and seed business. And about DuPont Pioneer, who was uh, with world leading uh, seed business. And all of them combined together from uh, Corteva AgriScience. Corteva is a global company. It's active in uh, about 140 different countries, employing 21,000 colleagues. It serves around more than 10 million uh, different customers, mainly farmers, and works on uh, more than 100 different crops around the world. I want to mention uh, the Corteva's sustainability goals because uh, this project is tied to those goals. Uh, the sustainability goals were released by Corteva last year, and this is a list of 40 different uh, goals, uh, measurable goals, to be obtained by 2030. And those commitments span across the globe and across the entire business. They are not just tied to the environment, but they are also uh, tied to the people that directly or indirectly interact with the Corteva, and mainly <clears throat> to farmers or to uh, our communities. I would like to just mention three of them, uh, which are the decreasing greenhouse gas emissions, improve soil health and enhance biodiversity, because those um, goals are strictly tied to the project I'm, I'm about to speak. Let's speak about the project uh, we worked on during uh, the past uh, few years. This project was possible thanks to the Field Forever initiative, a biomakers in, uh, initiative. So thank you, biomakers, for that. And thank you to the precious collaboration uh, of uh, Unimora and, uh, yeah, and to their precious support on this. I would like to uh, tell uh, a few details about the projects we worked on. Uh, this, uh, we worked on an experiment uh, focused on seed corn production. So we are speaking about inbred lines and not hybrid corn in this case. One of the characteristics of inbred lines, uh, among others, is that phenotypically they are much weaker than hybrid corn, they are shorter, they are less tolerant to stresses and less efficient on using nutrients. And this is something to think about when we uh, speak about those results. And uh, they are also able to highlight differences in case of stresses or uh, difficult conditions. Our main goals were mainly to improve production sustainability, improve seed yield and quality, and ensure production reliability, which is another very important thing. The project was concentrated in the Po Valley in northern Italy. The Po Valley is the big plain marked in the map on the right, uh, which is the main corn production area in Italy. Uh, in Po Valley, we have several different soil types. Uh, one of the characteristics is th there is that we have a very intensive agriculture and it's quite a fragile territory, mainly due to uh, problems related to nitrogen leaching uh, to groundwater and, and surface water as well. Uh, here I'm going to give you some details about the experimental pr procedure. Uh, we, we targeted four different uh, inbred lines as representative of our production portfolios. For each of them, we identified five different locations across Northern Italy. As a total, we had uh, 20 uh, different locations. In each of them, we had a standard soil analysis in order to precisely understand the soil characteristics in any of those locations. And then we had a sampling, a soil sampling tied to, to microbiota characterization. For this sampling, we defined uh, one sampling time, which was the same for all the location and it was uh, during seed maturation, when the grain was at around 50 to 40 percent of moisture. Uh, in each location, we collected 
10 subsamples, five of them from bulk soil and five of them from rhizosphere soil, meaning the soil uh, in close contact with the corn root system. Then we shipped all our samples to biomakers for microbiota characterization. So let's speak uh, about the results of our study. Uh, it won't be possible for me to go very deep into the details because as you can understand, some results might be, uh, I cannot disclose everything, but I'm going to share some basic and very interesting uh, findings uh, of this uh, project. First of all, uh, uh, the geographical characterization. Uh, as you see on the map, we had three different uh, main sampling areas in Northern Italy. And we wanted to understand if there were uh, significant differences in terms of uh, microbiota in those three different uh, areas. As you see from the plot on the right, uh, for two of them, the blue one and the green one, uh, there were practically no difference. They are almost completely overlapping. But one of them uh, was pretty much a clustering apart. And that suggested that there is an overall uh, different uh, microbiota in, those, uh, in that area. And the interesting point in that case was that that's the area where we reached the highest yield uh, in terms of final results. The second result is about uh, core microbiome. Uh, an interesting finding was that uh, independently of the genetic, independently of the location, there was a, a core microbiome that was uh, almost the same in any situation. This is especially true for bacteria. As you see, the heat, the heat map is quite uh, well-defined. It's a bit more confused for fungi, but overall, uh, the core microbiome was almost the same. So practically, we can suppose from this uh, result that the main difference is in the secondary uh, uh, taxa in terms of abundance. Another interesting comparison was uh, when we compared conventional versus organic uh, management. Uh, in these pictures, you can see a score level that was calculated by biomakers uh, as a measure of uh, the overall uh, biodiversity in our soil samples. In the left picture, you see the score from the conventional uh, location. This, the C score is a typical score for intensive farming practices, and it is exactly what we were expecting from, from those samples since they were from conventional agriculture. The second picture on the, on the right is showing uh, a B score. This is from the organic uh, location. Uh, this is not typical from organic agriculture. This is more uh, typical of integrated uh, farming. This is probably due to the fact that uh, that location uh, had a recent conversion to, to organic agriculture, but clearly showed an increase in terms of biodiversity in the sample. A very interesting result was uh, that related to the link between yield and microbiome. In this uh, uh, analysis, the samples were divided into two different groups. Those with low yield, low final yield, which are the blue ones, and those with medium high yield, which are the red ones. And you can clearly see on the bacteria side that those two different groups are uh, very well clustering apart. And this is a very interesting uh, finding. Uh, on the other hand, for the fungi, the situation was a bit uh, more confusing, but anyway, it's a very interesting uh, result. This said, uh, the idea was to calculate a yield predicting model uh, to try to predict uh, the final yield on the base of the, all the data that we collected during this experiment. And uh, first, uh, genetic and uh, environmental data were considered for the model. The first model 
which is called FIT2, only consider genetic and environment separately. Then in the second model, the FIT uh, model, also the interaction between genetic and environment was introduced. And that model uh, behaved consistently uh, better than the first one, meaning that the genetic and environmental and environment interaction play a significant, a significant role on determining the yield. So the best genetic is not the best one everywhere, but it depends on the environment. This is something pretty much expected, but uh, it was, let's say, proved during this uh, uh, modeling experience. But this is not the most interesting thing uh, because at a certain point, the microbiome uh, variable was uh, introduced in the model. So in this table, you can see three different categories of variable. The microbiome in the first column. Other variables mean the most significant event of microbiome, environment, and genetics. In the model number one, only environment and genetics were considered. And uh, this model uh, was able to explain almost 74% of yield variability, which is a good result. And, but the most interesting result uh, at model number two, uh, only microbiome was considered, excluding all the other uh, things. And it was able to explain 91% of the total variability, which is uh, amazing. In model number two, Three, all the different uh, parameters were considered and we reached 98% of accuracy, which is a very high level of accuracy. Other remarkable findings are that some species tend to be more abundant in low yield samples, some other in high yield samples. I cannot go deeper into the detail mentioning them, but this is, as you can imagine, uh, an important information. And I would like to conclude with some consideration about the importance of these uh, findings for seed production sustainability and the importance of soil microbial communities for seed uh, production sustainability. Soil microbial communities have an environmental importance. We know that very well from the literature. Uh, the soil is a big reservoir of carbon and the soil microbial communities play uh, a critical role on defining uh, the destiny of that carbon, on its storage, but also on its degradation. So it's very important to focus on them to uh, control the greenhouse gas emissions. What we can do uh, to promote soil microbial uh, activity and uh, biodiversity? One of the things is to promote practices to maintain a high level of microbial biodiversity. I think I'm thinking about, for example, those practices that lead to an increase of uh, organic matter in the soil, and also, for example, to the use of uh, uh, cover crops in order to keep the soil always covered with a with a, with a crop uh, all along the year and to ensure optimal condition for soil microbial communities to thrive also uh, when the, during non-productive uh, season. But also we know from the literature and we understood very well from this study that th those soil microbial communities have a critical importance also for, uh, for crop production. And they can help us uh, in many ways, and we can take advantage of them in many ways. One of those, uh, uh, one of the things we can do is to uh, better uh, understand them and get information in order to better drive area selection, seed production area selection, grower selection, and field selection to produce only in the best condition or in the best uh, production area. And they can, and the knowledge of soil microbial communities, as we saw from the study, can help us on, uh, on that. They can help uh, us guiding product positioning. So uh, position, positioning different products and different genetics in the best conditions. We can take advantage of useful microorganisms in order to reduce inputs. And in this uh, case, I'm speaking about both uh, using as external 
externally applied microorganisms and also uh, taking advantage of naturally present microorganisms or creating conditions for them uh, to be useful to us. And this way we can also better drive fertilization inputs um, as we also saw in one of the slides that were presented before um, so that we can save money and we can save uh, we can reduce the environmental impact of our uh, activity without losing uh, yield uh, and, uh, and production performances. And this is all from my side. I would like to thank you all for your attention. And I would like to say a special thank you to Biomakers for making this uh, project possible and provided us uh, all the analysis related to it, both lab and uh, statistical analysis. And also I would like to thank you the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia, namely uh, Professor Franza, for the precious collaboration on this project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Roberto. It is really interesting. Uh, now I'm going to invite Philip and Enrico, and we will go over the, the question from the attendees. Okay. There are only three questions. Um, just for the attendees, if you would like to to do any question to our speaker, just type on the Ask a Question section and uh, they will answer right now. So the first one is, I think it's for Philip because uh, it's about biomakers. So it's Joseph Cole asked, why did you pick random forest for your machine learning method? Um, um. Hi, um, Hi um, this is it's a it's a hard it's question because I, I, um, I was I not involved in, in such project, but um, you can, um, you I, can, can I can I can share, share with you an email, email and I can and give, and give you like a, like a detailed detail explanation about, about the reason why we used, why we used uh, uh, this uh, uh, random predictive model. model. But unfortunately, but I don't have the the right answer. So please just. If you like, um, just write us um, an email on, on biomaker.com um, or, or I can provide, uh, Philip, your email just to contact you. Uh, Luis Sousa um, asks, have you, mo have you models for grape vine? I think it's uh, related to GM, technology, uh, GM service. So, Philip. Um, um, if we have if like we have models like for grapevine, grape I mean, as I, I, mean, I, mentioned, I mentioned in, 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 one, of in one, of one of my slides, slides about the, about the different applications, applications of the Bicrop technologies, technologies. Um, um, we've been, we've been doing, doing and we have like, like several like success, success cases, cases in characterizing, in characterizing the rods based on the soil microbial arrangements. So basically, if knowing if comparing like a specific soil microbial arrangement within our database, we can infer that there are like specific conditions in this terroir, basically using the soil microbiome as an indicator. So we capture obviously the specific specific specificity of, of this environment based on the on the soil microbiome. Okay. Then we have another question from Ted Hinton. Will results indicating best management practices be shared with the public or will they only be shared with entities that commission the studies? For example, if an input company determines that the, their products in their soil health, can they hide the evidence from producer? I think it's, this one is for, for you, Roberto and Enrico, because it's related with the project. And, yeah, I can answer on that, I think. And th those results will be clearly uh, analyzed and uh, some of them cannot be disclosed because uh, they are part of a non-disclosure agreement. 
but uh, part of them uh, will be those not strictly related to the business will be uh, uh, shared and uh, they will be part also of a scientific publication. Yeah. Anything? I confirm. Okay, so next question is from Erika Lumini. Um, she said, she asked, uh, what about M AM fungi? It is a, it, is it a problem of ITS primers which are not the best for AMF detection? Good, good, good question. question. Um, um, actually, actually uh, we, are testing, we are testing, uh, we are, we are, we've been testing, we've been obviously, testing the, our proprietary markers, markers in the case of ITS, ITS in, order in order to compare these uh, primers, uh, primers with, with other, other ones, ones and, and we, we do believe we that the, the, those markers have a good, have a good uh, precision, uh, precision um, um, to go to beyond, beyond uh, the species, uh, the species level, level detection, detection. Uh, uh, but obviously, obviously you have like you several have primers, primers on the market. market. This is our technology, and, and instead of like of just like focusing, just this is this is a bit on, 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 on uh, one of the main one competitive, competitive advantage of biomakers is that we, instead of just focusing on specific markers to detect specific microorganisms, we tend to or we like, we to, like think to think the whole the soil microbiome, microbiome as an ecosystem, an ecosystem where all where those all microorganisms, microorganisms interact, interact with each other. Each other. So getting, getting this, this full, full picture, picture of, of, of the ecosystem, ecosystem and functions, functions obviously is a key advantage key when analyzing, analyzing a soil, a soil an, ecosystem an ecosystem of, of living, of living microorganisms. microorganisms. Okay, so we have two, well, we have three more questions. So um Doug asks us it is well known that the timing of soil collection during life cycle of the crop is important for understanding the microbiome what was the timing for soil collection that is recommended for the results from Corteva so up to you Enrico or Roberto they know we selected, selected the timing, the timing of, of sampling in, in accordance in with biomaker also remember that maize has a relatively short uh, time for development in the field. So uh, we selected the, um, the flowering time as the most useful uh, plant developmental stage that let enough time, enough time to the plant to stay in the soil and to attract and contact microbiota, the microbiota, and then from the flowering stage on, you have the grain filling period. So it is the most uh, important phase for the seed production, for seed quality, seed germinability, and seed viability. That's for my part. Roberto, if you want to add, feel free. No, that's exactly the same that I wanted to say. Wanted to say. Yeah, no, nothing to add. Nothing to add. Yeah. Okay, so we go for the next one. Uh, I think it's for Roberto. So Michael Kluenkang uh, asks, Roberto, you mentioned to foster locally available microorganism to better match yield and inbreed line performance. Are there any specific measures that you suggest? It's hard to say at this stage, in my opinion. Uh, we, we understood some potential uh, locally available microorganisms. Uh, uh, but uh, about specific measure, uh, I'm not sure I can give you an answer at this time. This will be uh, the further step for the study. Today, uh, what we did was the, the first step to understand the differences. Uh, <laughs> the only thing that I can think about is to focus on those soil where some certain species are, are available. But more than this, at this time, I think I cannot, I cannot say. Anything to add, Enrico or or Philip? No, uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. So next one is from Luis Sousa. Uh, the fertilization chain, the quality of microbiome, and the plant are less resistant to diseases and pests. 
Así se acuesta. I can uh, partly answer to that. Uh, as you saw from the slides, we had uh, several locations under conventional agriculture, and they had more or less similar level of fertilization. And also being different location, it's difficult to make precise comparison on the effect of fertilization. Uh, but uh, we had one organic uh, field, let's say, and we had uh, a different type of fertilization there. And uh, as you saw, we, we observed some uh, differences in that case. So uh, I cannot say that uh, fertilization can make a big difference in just one year, but for sure the multi-year effect is there, uh, at least in terms of fertilization type. Okay. So just to add, have, just to add sorry, something sorry. on top of Juan that, B. something Juan B. Um, it like several several studies has demonstrated that the overuse of NPK or uh, chemical fertilizers can lead to a shift in the microbial uh, microbiome and thus obviously affecting the whole functions of the soil microorganisms present in a, in a soil. So for example, there was a study um, in a, in a top, top, uh, top journal that basically shows that the overuse uh, in, 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 in annual crops of like uh, synthetic nitrogen, in, the, in this case was urea, lead to a basically a, to a higher relative abundance of denitrification bacteria, and obviously this can lead to a lower uh, nitrogen use efficiency in the end. So, and uh, this is just one example, but obviously if you think about the resilience of a soil, always uh, crop protectants and high use of uh, chemical chemical uh, compounds such as fertilizer with high salinity can lead obviously to a less resilient soil. And this is what Bicrop, our Bicrop rate technology, this Bicrop rate sustainability index is measuring, how this disturbance is impacting um, the resilience of a system. Okay, so we go for the last question of the session. So uh, Maria Hernandez asks, uh, from your research, do you think a specialized microbiome for a particular crop system is better or worse than promoting a higher biodiversity of bacteria and fungi or fungi? Is there a lot of redundancy or do we lose important function when the microbiome specialized due to the agricultural practices? I just open the question for all of you. If I can start, uh, I would say that the we should consider the the microbiome uh, like a sort of library, not just of um, species, but of biological functions. So if we can manage the microbiome as a series of biological function, uh, we can understand that the different agricultural systems can modify the redundancy of different functions in this kind of library. But what we could do is to manage it, increasing or trying to increase some of the functions that are more relevant for the crop performance that could be a possible way to manage it. Of course, the different agricultural systems have an influence on the soil microbiota. And that's what we observed also in our uh, study. That's my opinion. Anything, anything else to add? No, it's fine. I just want to, just to, want add, to quickly add quickly something. something. I, guess, I guess obviously, obviously there, is there is no, no 
better, better or worse, or worse soil, microbiome. soil microbiome. I mean, throughout the history of farming, obviously, we, we've been focusing on just on yields, and obviously this has created less resilience um, ecosystems and, and a system, basically an agro system that relies highly on crop protectants product, because obviously um, we don't have the same, uh, I, I, I like to, to think on, on that, we are losing, obviously, the, the, the genetic potential of, of the soil microbiome to produce, for example, biocontrol agents. So there is a disbalance in the ecosystem, and, and this obviously has led to, to, to the conditions, to, to the soil conditions, and, the, and these big concerns today about like the soil depletion and, and the, the big problem of, of like soil health today. But it's we we are under under other other problems other challenges today this is this is i mean for me at least the key question if i can uh give my answer to this uh question uh not being a microbiologist uh i think uh it depends a lot uh, normally uh uh, uh richer biodiversity would be helpful, uh, of course, on creating a more resilient uh, pedological environment. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily help us in any condition. So uh, the, the soil microbial system is a very complex environment and uh, sometimes it's uh, difficult uh, to get an advantage only just by increasing uh, biodiversity. And it's also very important to understand the interaction with the plant that we want to grow. Okay, so that was the last question. So thank you so much, uh, Roberto Gatti, Enrico Francia, Philip. Uh, thank you so much, it was really interesting. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, this uh, webinar is, has been recorded, so it's going to be sent to everyone uh, maybe next week. And, and that's it. We will send you after the, the webinar, we'll send you to all of you a survey just to give us your feedback about new topics or how do you feel about this webinar. And that's it. If you would like to contact us, just go to uh, Biomaker website uh, or you can contact Roberto and, and Enrico through the email that they shared and that's everything from me so thank you so much to all the people and the attendees thank you everybody, thank you. everybody. thanks so much thank you see you have a nice day bye bye, bye. 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 ciao roberto ciao, ciao. ciao. ciao.